My role was uh, working with a second year resident who uh, had been directed with me to go to the emergency room. We were up on the second floor uh, surgery clinic that day and um, we uh, had patients that had come in during the night from the, uh, for various complaints and the, the chief surgery resident directed us to go to the emergency room to take care of them and see which ones needed to be admitted. At that point, uh, we had gone down and the way the hospital emergency room was laid out at that time, there were cubicles with curtains in front and sections of the emergency room were for surgery patients, internal medicine patients, uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and pediatrics. And um, there were two operating rooms uh, that were downstairs that were, were uh, more major uh, surgical procedures could be performed for resuscitation before taking them into the hospital. And uh, we were in front of one of those when we heard uh, the announcement from the triage desk that uh, they needed needed uh, stretchers, and um, there was just a lot of banging noise, which is, which was unusual. I mean, you just wouldn't ha hear that. Uh, they were hollering and screaming uh, through the intercom, and so um, at that point, uh, a Dr. Red Duke uh, was the chief resident uh, running the emergency room. He um, uh, was in charge and uh, immediately started going to that first uh, operating room, which was operating room two, actually. Uh, there he, um, uh, as we came out of our cubicle, they were rolling in a, a gentleman who's uh, gray hair um, and uh, wearing a silver uh, gray suit, alligator boots, and striped tie and I thought what, what are they doing here at the emergency room at, at Parkland County Hospital uh, and it was Governor Conley so we went into that room uh, to assist Red Duke in the initiation of the resuscitation. At that point um, we uh, uh, addressed him to see where his injuries were. He had a, a gaping wound in his chest. Uh, we put the uh, uh, I put some gauze across the, uh, the wound in order to seal it so that he could uh, re reconstitute perhaps with a chest uh, tube uh, the, the lung on that side. Uh, Carico, Dr. Carico, is, Dr. James Carico, he's a second year surgery resident, said let's go and get ready for the next patient. So as we walked out of that operating room they were wheeling uh, and President uh, Kennedy, and, and you know, it's just disbelief when I first saw it. I said, they, they, that wasn't President Kennedy. They probably had doubles that they put in the car and run around and, and show. And there was a funny movie about that some years ago about a duplicate. Um, and uh, so uh, immediately, uh, this part uh, is just Im embedded in my brain. Is just this part of his uh, head was blown away and the brains were exposed. The calvarium uh, had slipped behind his head and was still connected by, by the, the scalp and the base. Um, and so we wheeled him in and uh, started to get the IV uh, started. Uh, Carico went for, uh, to do intratracheal intubation and I can still hear him say, you know, boy, did I luck out, I just got that tube past a, a severance of the trachea uh, and, and to, to uh, breathe for him. Uh, at that point, uh, uh, and Jackie Kennedy had come by uh, along and she was walking behind the gurney. Uh, her dress was all uh, matted with uh, blood and clots and, and, and brain tissue dropping from the, from the skirt. Um, and she was standing outside uh, the doors were closed and uh, at that point the Secret Service um, men came in and they were um, you know, cur cursing and, and just uh, in, in their anxiety and, and their stress of the day uh, uh, then said, uh, you know, wanted to know who was in the room with them. And I'd taken off my white jacket because it was uh, uh, clean that day and I'd just gotten from the cleaners and uh, I didn't want to get any blood, which sometimes happened for our patients. We were 
resuscitating. And um, so they, you know, I had a tie on, and they said, who are you? And I said, I'm a senior medical student, uh, uh, Schorlmer. And so they said, well, get the hell out. And so I was starting the IV, and, um, which was kind of odd because you want, to, you want to get the resuscitation going while there's still blood pressure enough to, uh, to insert a, a, a needle. Um, and um, so I left and immediately went to the phone uh, at that point to call the nurse surgery uh, chief of staff, who was Dr. Kim Clark, and uh, Dr. Charles ba uh, Charlie Baxter, who was um, the acting chief of surgery for the Department of Surgery uh, for the medical school. Doc uh, and I put in a page for them to come down immediately that the president had been shot. Um, at that point, um, I went. I called my brother, who was a twin brother, who's working in the blood bank at the time, and he. Um, uh, I told him to bring two units of O negative blood uh, that we would suspected we might need, and had been directed by Dr. Carico, and uh, doc, and then I put gave it back to them. Uh, they. Um, weren't allowing anybody else in there, so there was all these people that were uh, in the uh, hall of the uh, going to the emergency room, look, trying to look in through a little glass window, and there was just a, a lot of um, uh, things going on inside and out of, of the excitement of the, that uh, tragedy. Um, when uh, when I reflect on it. There were, uh, there was no one uh, assisting uh, uh, Jackie at that point. She was just standing uh, outside the door, um, uh, in shock. She she wasn't crying or anything. She just had a, a, a distant look on her face. Uh, one of the medical students walked behind the uh, the area there because it was blocked off, and came in th through the back and started talking to her. So he was consoling her. Um, and that was the only person who was around her. It was odd that there weren't Secret Service surrounding her or assisting her. Uh, and uh, at that point then, uh, about 30 minutes later, a priest came in uh, and, and then uh, I guess around 1 o'clock or 1.15 they pronounced that uh, he was dead. Uh, when he came in he had some agonal respiratory movement when he was just uh, being wheeled into the room, uh, but that injury was so severe uh, because of how that impact and what it does to the brain that uh, I'm sure it affected the the breathing centers for the in the, in the uh, brain uh, to for him to continue to be able to breathe even after that point. Uh, it was it was uh, mind numbing. I mean, there wasn't things that you could concentrate on from that. A point forward that day. Uh, no one tried to make diagnostic uh, decisions about whether that person could stay or not. So after uh, James Carrico uh, got through, you know, we just went through the whole a gamut of all those patients and admitted them until we could have some other staff uh, looking in on them and making a decision whether they needed to have surgery. But that carried through for the whole week. Um, the uh, issues of what transpired because uh, there were, it was uh, another, it was a, a day and a time of um, the fears of, of what was going to happen in the government and the way the government was going. Uh, Dallas was uh, considered a, a, a band of, of conservatism that was significant. Um, and so the disappointment of what happened really affected everybody, including people who were uh, from Dallas to begin with. So there was so much sadness, but also uh, sadness from the tragedy that it happened, had to happen in Texas or it happened in Dallas itself. Uh, because no one, I think, really wanted that sort of thing to be uh, a mark. Uh, on them, but also to have even happened. Um, other other things that went on for me in that time 
uh, was that the, it was an oddity. The next day I had to go and I was directed to do an EKG. Uh, at that point, all medical students did uh, what we call scut work. It was the work of diagnosis, drawing bloods, um, and, uh, and doing EKGs. We were the technicians doing an electrocardiogram. And I uh, did an electrocardiogram when I was on call that next day on Governor Conley, and the oddity there was we didn't have a SICU. He was uh, he remained in the recovery room for the surgery uh, uh, after surgery, and uh, you walked in. It was kind of a dark area, and it was it was a little off of where all the recovery room patients were, but not that far. There weren't a lot of Secret Service people around or, or anyone watching over him. I mean, I could have been anybody walking in to, to do that EKG. Uh, so um, obviously I think that that's changed for people in terms of the injuries that would have happened and probably would have had more people around. But I guess there was still trust in, 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 in Governor Conley was, uh, I'm sure there was somebody there, we just didn't see him in the forefront. Uh, my room, uh, had a roommate, uh, Dr. Fred Bieberdorf, uh, who was a senior medical student with me at the time, and he happened to be the, uh, the uh, jail doctor. So the next morning he was on site when uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was being transferred uh, uh, from the city jail and I had to then ride in the ambulance to uh, to Parkland Hospital with him uh, and he did he didn't get anything out of Lee Harvey uh, uh, he was in and out I think they thought that he was dead already because he was hemorrhaging from a shot through the through the pancreas I mean through the uh, spleen and the liver both uh, they got him to the operating room, though, and he was still alive. Uh, and he died because he had cardiac arrest there. And and at that time, they thought that maybe the because they were massively transfusing him with uh, cold blood, that that they couldn't revive the heart and make it start up again. Uh, otherwise, maybe he might have lived. And nowadays, we know, and and there are blood warmers for patients who have to receive massive blood transfusions. But it wasn't something of my making, it was just something to be there. And so I never thought of it as anything other than I was a witness to a very significant part of history, that, uh, that there was personal uh, touching uh, and, and, and a, a mere chance of, of resuscitation that really wasn't. Is it something that you don't like to talk about? Um, well, it's a it's it's a short piece of history. It's not something I did, per se. Um, so there were m more uh, important figures in this whole s s uh, sphere of of this story. Um, the doctors that uh, that at least were there, who were higher up on the echelon of trained physicians, the the department heads. Uh, so as a senior medical student, um, you're kind of looked, uh, I guess at that point, you know, senior medical students are, are a non-entity, so to speak. When Dr. Um, Kiriko gave his testimony to the Warren Commission, uh, he gave a list of people who were there. He didn't give my list, but he, he, he and I were kind of like a team. You follow, uh, you follow a resident around. And uh, so one of the things was, well, you don't need to be uh, taking away from your time on your education or where you are. You hear of things later uh, that went on, perhaps in terms of those other instances. I started to talk about Dr. Bieberdorf, and uh, you know, you, you get together sometimes on reunions and you hash over things, but uh, there wasn't any uh, documentation that I was there per se, just as there weren't of a lot of uh, other um, students that were 
perhaps in that area, maybe not even the, the person who was speaking to Jackie. Um, it's, it's the work of the day as far as what we were doing. I mean, that's what you're trained, that's what you go in for. Um, and then you go on to the next patient and may do the same thing. Um, I guess you look to your professors and they're the important people, the, 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 the residents who are training with you and helping you to learn are those important entities. And I, I didn't feel myself as being the lifesaver. And so uh, if you weren't uh, that part of saving a life, it's, it's just a memory that you have. And you discuss that with your friends sometimes. And as I remember November the 22nd, uh, years, I'll, I'll just ca casually ask nurses or uh, someone, uh, you know, what happened this day, and a lot of people weren't remembering that day. They don't put that day into context of, of such a uh, momentous occasion of, of tragedy. Um, I think as we grow older, memories begin to be more and more important. Um, and um, uh, there may be some emotion about it. It's still uh, easy to disbelieve, I mean, that that happened. It just, uh, uh, that was just something that in today's world you just, or in, in that day's world, you wouldn't suspect. I think there have been so many uh, terrorist events nowadays that almost, I think, the, the public is becoming uh, uh, used to it to a point that it doesn't make the same uh, emotion that it used to. Back then, there were there were, there were days and, and weeks that uh, we couldn't stop talking about it. In those days, you didn't have cell phones. You didn't have uh, everything that we have now to communicate more rapidly and bring in those people. I mean, if we if the the speed at which they came from uh, from Dealey Plaza to uh, down Harry Hines was quite quite rapid. I mean, so there may have been uh, there have been some remarks about being notified a couple of minutes beforehand. But I think those minutes were from the front desk to from the time that they arrived at the front of the emergency room till they arrived in the in the uh, suite itself. So. Uh, there wasn't, you know, we didn't have any way of communicating, I suppose. Maybe the radio of the police car coming and saying, we're bringing in wounded. There are people who are paranoid. There are people, just as the person who shot him, um, having uh, a, a pathological vision of life or of, of who's the enemy. And, uh, there are opportunists as well. I mean, people who read, write books want to sell books, and, uh, and those, uh, the more weird they can get in terms of information, I think, and, and building up uh, little side stories uh, will be able to do that. And as far as that's concerned, that's beyond my expertise in terms of that uh, dealing of who how many bullets could be fired from a gun. Um, most recently, I, there was something in the Wall Street Journal about how the bullet uh, was tumbling and, and sh therefore was able to show how it uh, created its injury both to two people at one time instead of three bullets. So um, uh, someone was mentioning this morning about, well, since uh, Jack Kennedy had his back brace that kept him from falling forward and therefore it put him in danger of having his head hit on the second time. Um, you know, those are into the people who, who do physics, uh, who, who uh, know uh, the, the abilities of, uh, of a shooter to be able to accomplish that. Uh, so was there somebody on the grassy you knoll? Uh, you know, I, I guess you have to just read the books and listen to the experts. There's so much to be doing as a senior medical student, to be uh, learning. Um, it, it's 
beyond the pale to even think of what you need to know in, in the books and what you are able to know. Uh, and so those were your goals. And uh, in that immediate time frame, you're reading some what you get in the newspaper or hear on the radio. Uh, to become the expert over time was something that I just didn't have time. As I said, we moved around and so there were all these other issues that were part of uh, the more important picture. Uh, you know, you knew what you knew uh, and I left that up to others to try to decide. Because that's, that's something on big anniversaries, everyone asks where you were. Oh, everybody can say, everyone who's alive at that time and, and remembering. I mean, and that's what you find out once you start talking about November the 22nd. Oh yeah, I remember that. I mean, I was here and and uh, tears were always a part of that for almost everyone who, who remembered. I, mean, I, I got to imagine at dinner parties when people start talking about where they were when Kennedy was shot, you've got the, you got the trump card. Like, you got the hole yeah. on that, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, um, uh, yeah, that, that stops the conversation uh, if someone answer, uh, you know, brings it up. And I'm sure that's going to happen in the next week or so. <laughs> I mean, it's already happened. What What do the the people in the in the office when when they find out? You know, uh, what what is what, you know what do they say or what, what is the reaction when they know when they learn this about you and some of them have known you for years and and, and, and yes and say why didn't you why didn't you why didn't you tell me that What do you tell them? Is, yeah, is, is it something that you just don't make a big deal? About? I don't make a big deal about it. It's just, well, you, you tell a story and you then assume everybody else knows and, you know, somebody else comes into your life or, or passes through and then you have to tell a story again. So it's, uh, I guess, a little repetitive, but it's also, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not an accomplishment. I mean, uh, delivering quadruplets was a, was a exciting thing for me and it was accomplishment of healthy children and uh, those are things that are, are something that I participated in and was successful with and hopefully it will continue to be. I mean obviously someone had to be the first person to take care of him when he came in the door. Yeah. I just I'm amazed that it was a senior student. <laughs> well it's who's there. It's who's there, and um, and I was uh, uh, at, at Southwestern University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. Uh, senior students uh, played a big role, and uh, we always looked. And I don't know if you want to publish this at all, but we always made a comment about the senior students were better at handling clinical aspects of care than the interns coming from the East Coast schools when they came in to do an internship. Because there was a lot more practical work that we did. I mean, we were allowed to participate in that. And so there was a, a growing uh, up of, of being a physician, I think. We didn't know everything, but there was good supervision. And, um, and I felt uh, I had a great education when I went off to, to be an intern or a resident. 